Okay, so what, what we've established essentially a natural polynomial time property, which is not invariant under this. And this led us to ask, well, linear algebra, which is where we found this property in some sense, is unexplored to some extent in terms of definability in fixed point with counting. What can we do? You know, what problem, it might be the source of more natural problems that are not definable and possibly more natural extensions of fixed point with counting, which allow us to get closer to the goal of, of expressing all of polynomial time, yes? That's right. Yeah, so the point is that you can, yeah, so this is the simplest case in some sense. So we can prove that for any finite field, this solvability is not definable, right? It's, and in fact, that is what we do. We, 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 in our paper, we actually show something uh, more in, in for any finite abelian group, you take systems of equations over that group, and you can do, essentially do the same argument. So it, it, it's undefinable. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I just use the two element field as a, because it's simple to describe, and it already captures the Cy Fuhrer construction. But yes, we, our result is a bit more general. So in fact, that's where I'm, so we, we started to look at what can we do in linear, what natural problems from linear algebra are definable in fixed point counting or not definable. And maybe from the undefinable ones, we can get some natural ideas for how, how to extend the logic. So basically, in the, the remainder, I have just under 40 minutes, I take it, uh, about 40 minutes, I want to, uh, you know, it, it, it'll be focused on this, which is very much current work, okay? So when I talk about problems from linear algebra, again, think of it as this way. For instance, uh, and now if you have an arbitrary set I and a binary relation on it, we can think of this binary relation as a matrix, as a zero, one matrix. Usually, when you think of a matrix, of course, you have an ordering on the rows and the columns, which is ordering on, imposing an ordering on the set I. We want to avoid this ordering at all costs, right? We are, we, are, we are looking ultimately for order invariant properties. But there are many natural properties, obviously, of the matrix which are invariant under permutations of I. Those are the kinds of properties we are interested in, okay? Now, this is simply because think of M as a uh, linear operator on a vector space whose basis is given by I. Most interesting properties of the, of the linear operator don't depend upon a particular ordering of the basis. They're, you know, invariant. So, uh, okay. Uh, so we can na ask natural questions about the definability, even when we think of I, the underlying domain, as being unordered. For instance, matrix multiplication. So here's the idea. Say we have, we have a set, which we think of as the domain, in other words, the, the underlying thing which indexes, indices the rows and the elements, the rows and columns um, of, uh, of our matrix. And we want to define, we have two binary relations on the set, A and B, which we think of as matrices over zero and one, as zero one matrices, so matrices over the two element field. And we want to define their product. In other words, I write down a formula which with two free variables x and y, which given binary relations a and b, defines the binary relation which is the matrix product. And it's actually quite easy to do this with a counting term, right? Because I just need to pick out those positions, uh, x and y, for which the number of z such that axz and bzy is true, right? But both of those are true. That number should be odd, okay? And that's, all, that's what this formula does. Okay. So that's just matrix multiplication written out in, well, just first order with counting. And the application of, of induction allows us to, say, do exponentiation. Okay? Just do repeated multiplication. More interesting, so what do I mean by exponentiation? I mean we are given a matrix A as a binary relation. We are given a number variable nu, 
And we are defining a binary relation which gives us the matrix A raised to the power nu. Okay? I call this u power because effectively this number I'm thinking of now is given in unary. More interesting is uh, if the number is given in binary, in other words, it's given as a unary relation over the number domain, or think of it as a formula with, with, with one free number variable. And now, instead of, instead of just iteration, we do repeated squaring. It turns out we can still do exponentiation. So I'm given a binary relation on, on my element domain, a unary relation on the numbers, and I want to compute a raised to the power n, where n is the number coding coded by that, interpreted as a binary string, okay? And we can do this, all in fixed point with counting. This is not very difficult. What this allows us to do is, for instance, it allows us to define whether a matrix is invertible. This, was a, this is, follows from an observation in a paper by Blas and Gurevich, which is, that so we, they, they actually show non-singularity of a matrix over Z2 is expressible in fixed points with counting. And I mean, I'm not going to run through the, the, the argument here. It's, it, 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 it's not very difficult if you know the, the, the algebra. But um, basically, if you look at the general linear group, of, what's called the general, general linear group of degree N over Z2, that is just the group of invertible matrices under matrix multiplication, or the, of N by N matrices, then you can calculate its order and that's the order of the group, which means A raised to the power of that order for any invertible matrix is the identity. And since that is just an exponential number you can calculate, you can produce a formula in the number domain, which is a binary representation of this number, and then you just use the exponentiation I had on the previous slide. And that allows, gives you a test for testing whether a matrix is invertible. And in fact, all, also for computing the inverse, because obviously if A to the N is the identity, then A to the N minus one is the inverse of A. Okay, so you can compute the inverse of a matrix. Now, so this, it seems you can, there's quite a lot you can do. And, and just to place it into context, and this answers your question come up from some time ago. The problems we're looking at are not p-complete. If you want to place them in terms of computational complexity, the natural place is this complexity class called parity L. So parity L is defined as the complexity class containing languages for which there's a non-deterministic logarithmic space machine with the following acceptance condition that a string is in the language L if and only if the number of accepting paths on M on, on input X is odd, right? So you look at the parity of the number of accepting paths of this non-deterministic machine, and that tells you whether a string is in the language or not, okay? Um, in terms of inclusions, we know that L is included in NL RDLP. I just threw, sorry. I threw in another one, UL. This is unambiguous logarithmic space machines, which are included in both parity L and NL. I think the general belief in complexity theory is that probably NL is actually included in parity L, but this is unproved. Uh, in fact, I think the belief is that NL is equal to UL, uh, because if it's not, then some rather unexpected uh, things happen. But, uh, but this, is the, this is the situation as we know it, the, of the inclusion of these parity cl classes. Um, a natural parity L-complete problem is parity gap, given an acyclic directed graph G with vertices S and T, is the number of distinct paths from S to T odd. This we can express in fixed point with counting, by the way, parity gap. Because this is just, you take the matrix for the graph G, you think of it as a, a matrix over the two element field, raise it to the power of the size of the matrix, and then you look at the entry from S to T, and it'll tell you whether the number of paths is even or odd. Okay, so this is, a, a, this is expressible in, parity gap is expressible in fixed point with counting. In terms of complexity, in fact, all of these problems turn out to be equivalent. The non-singularity of matrices, the invertibility of matrices, actually inverting a matrix, finding the rank of a matrix. I should, I could also have uh, 
right? They're all parity L complete under log space reduction. So they're all equivalent to parity gap, okay? All right, I had this. And this has all appeared in this paper by Budrock et al. back in 92, okay? But what we show is that in terms of definability in fixed point with counting, there's a difference between these, right? I just told you that the first two are definable in fixed point with counting. We can check whether a matrix is invertible. We can compute the inverse of a matrix, or there's a formula expressing the inverse of a matrix. But we can't determine the rank of a matrix, because if we could, we could check whether a system of equations is solvable. You just take the, a system of equations is solvable if you, you take the rank of the matrix, and it's unchanged when you add the rank of the, the column on the right-hand side, right? Because that has to be in the span of the left-hand side for it to be solvable. Um, so he, so, so, so here's what we can say. Fix, over any finite field, matrix multiplication, non-singularity of matrix, and the inverse of matrix are all definable in fixed point with counting, as I've sort of argued. It turns out it requires a little bit more work to show that determinants of matrices are definable in fixed point with counting. This is rather tricky to show. And uh, uh, in fact, all the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial are definable. But the rank of a matrix is undefinable, and the solvability of systems of equations is undefinable by the proof I sketched to you. Right, so this was in our paper in VIX 2009, all of these. Um, this led us to think about rank as a natural numerical parameter, which could be used just like counting was, as an extension of the logic. Okay, it's a bit. It's. It, it, I mean, I'm. Uh, it's a bit less wieldy, if you will, more unwieldy than uh, than just counting. But we introduce an, ocean, an operator for matrix rank as a, as, a, as a way to extend our logic. So the idea, the, de the definition is a, as follows. As with fixed point and counting, we have terms of element sort and numeric sort, right? It's, a t it's the two-sorted logic. Now, if you have a term of numeric sort, eta x, y, we think of it, so x and y are now variables of element sort. So we think of this as defining a matrix where you let x range over the elements of A, you let y range over the elements of A, and the entries of the matrix are given by the numbers you get by evaluating the term eta at, at x and y, okay? And now we allow in our logic, our, we allow ourselves a term which basically takes the rank of this matrix, eta x, y. And this is a term of number sort. And what do we mean? It means the rank of this matrix when these entries eta x, y are interpreted as eta a, as I said, eta a, well, eta a, b, I said, mod q. And strictly speaking, so this rank operator is parameterized by a particular q. And we do this for all prime values q. Okay, we allow ourselves this rank operator. Okay, so I like to argue that this is not that far. I mean, the argument I, you know, we put forth in this paper is the following. When Immerman said that counting was what was missing from fixed point, um, he picked the too weak a form of counting. He added the ability to count the cardinality of, a definable, of definable sets, which was missing. What we're saying is you're still missing the ability to count the cardinality of, sorry, count the dimension of definable vector spaces, which is what this allows you to do, right? This eta x, y gives you effectively, you know, a, 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 the vector space spanned by the columns of this matrix, and the rank is the dimension of that vector space, okay? And just the, the ability of counting that Immerman proposed was too weak to allow this kind of counting. So this is, in that sense, a generalized form of counting. Uh, and you can see it's generalized in the sense that we don't need counting once we have this, because 
to count the number of elements that satisfy formula phi is just pick the rank of the matrix, that particular matrix, which is just zeros everywhere except along the diagonal, you pick the elements where phi is true. Right? You look at that matrix and take its rank. That's just the number of elements which satisfy phi. Okay? So you don't, you don't need that. So we define this, what we call fixed point with rank. We can do everything we can do in fixed point with counting. In addition, we can express the solvability of linear systems of equations. We can express the cipher Riemann graphs property. We can express the order on multipedes. In other words, the various polynomial time properties that had been shown not to be definable now become definable in this logic. Three colorability is not definable as far as we know. <laughs> you wouldn't expect that, but anyway. Um, so that's, that's our, that was the logic we proposed. Okay. We also explored the power of the rank operator in the absence of fixed points. What happens if you just add a rank operator first order logic? It turns out to be quite interesting. Already, um, you can do things like you can express deterministic transfer closure. In other words, you can express and even symmetric transfer closure. So you can express reachability on undirected graphs with no fixed points in the logic. Okay. You can express the solvability of linear equations. You don't need the fixed points for that. Right? All you need is the rank operator. That's where I'm going. Exactly. So uh, Kamal has anticipated it. Um, looking uh, ahead, actually more generally, if you take the rank, quanti qu rank operators modulo p for any prime p on ordered structures, first order with rank p captures mod pf but you need an order to, to do the capturing result, okay? So, uh, and this is just an easy, an easy exercise to show you how with the rank operators and in just first order logic, you can uh, uh, express reachability on undirected graphs. It's quite trivial. It's a, it's a simple reduction from the reachability problem to, uh, uh, from the reachability problem to solving a system equations over a two element field. Basically, for each, throw in a variable for every vertex in your graph, and for every edge x, for every edge uv, you throw in the equation xu plus xv is zero. You say xs equals one, xt equals zero. This system is solvable if and only if the graph is, if there's no path from s to t. Because this is, you know, this, this essentially ensures that the variables at any two endpoints of an edge must take the same value. Since you said that xs has the value one, everything in the connected component of xs, of, uh, of s, must take the value one, but you require t to take the value zero, so the graph must be disconnected, okay? Uh, so, yeah, like it says over there, and this then, then shows, allows you to do this. Okay, this is crucially undirected graphs. Could you do the same for directed graphs? Could you express directed graphs in, uh, in this form? Well, if you could, you'll prove that inclusion, okay? Obviously, because uh, directed reachability is complete for NL, and definability in here would place it in parity L. Sorry? You might be able to prove that you cannot do it, uh, especially in the absence of order, yes. Especially in the absence of order, it might be, yeah. But now, this is where I want to get to. One thing we do prove, which is more of an inconvenience, you see, with counting, when we introduce these counting operators, we said, this is the number of elements that satisfy phi. We could have introduced a more general form of counting, count the number of tuples satisfying phi. We don't need to, because with this, it turns out you can define this. It requires a little bit of work that, I mean, obviously, counting the number of tuples is not enough to just count from column by column, but a little bit of work. You can see how to count number of tuples just given this. We are in a bit more difficult situation. So I'll, I showed you I can define matrix X, Y, but now why shouldn't I take tuples over here and take a matrix, you know, n to the k by n to the k matrix? Well, certainly, why not? So we allow that. Okay, and 
we would have liked to be able to show similar collapse and say that this was unnecessary. You could get these higher, higher arity rank operators from the lower arity ones. But in fact, we proved the opposite. That is that they form, a, they form a hierarchy. The proof requires vocabularies of increasing arity. It's, it, it derived from a construction due to Hella. So it's still conceivable that, say, over a fixed vocabulary like graphs, the arity hierarchy collapses, but we don't know this. But now this means yeah, ultimately what we want. As, uh, as Fokion su suggested, for instance, we might want to show that directly reachability is not in first order with rank, but now we need tools for proving an expressibility. So we get back to now find the appropriate notion of equivalence, find a suitable game for that, and can we start proving an expressibility results for logics with rank? And this is not easy, okay? So Bjarke Holm, my PhD student in his thesis, gave a nice game characterization, but it's not an easy one to use, particularly because of these arities. We, it, it, it makes the definition really unwieldy, and we haven't actually managed, we, while we have a definition of a game, we, have, we don't yet have an application where we can actually, we, we've used it to prove something is undefinable. Well, a minor one where at the RIT1 case, uh, uh, yeah, what it says there. We can show that if P and Q are distinct primes, then uh, solvability of linear equations mod Q cannot be defined in using just uh, the oper rank operators mod P. But again, we are only able to do this for RIT1 because the game becomes rather unwieldy for higher RITs. I'll give you the definition of the game, but um, it's, uh, and you will see, it's, it, it, it's not easy to use. So we thought of various possibilities, right? You, you had the Emmerman and Lander characterization here. You pick a set, super, spoiler picks a set, duplicate register to respond with a set of the same size. You could do something very similar. Spoiler picks, uh, um, choose, constructs a matrix. Duplicator has to respond with a matrix of the same rank. Spoiler challenges an entry, duplicator has to respond with that. The trouble is, to make this work, you would need to ensure that the spoiler is restricted to picking matrices that are definable. It turns out the same issue arises in the Immerman and Lander game, but they prove that allowing spoiler the extra power doesn't you know, change the equivalence relation. So you, could, you get the simplified game. We don't know how to prove that, and requiring only picking definable relations as matrices seems a bit sort of like catching your own tail because definability is what we're trying to characterize in the first place, right? So, um, so we weren't quite happy with that. We were trying to think of a bijection, something analogous to Hella's bijection game. What is a bijection? Requiring duplicator to specify, bijection means, bijections are precisely those maps which preserve cardinality of all sets. And cardinality is, of course, the thing that's captured here. What are the maps which preserve dimensions of all vector spaces? Well, there are the sort of linear maps. So, you know, we, we thought about a game where duplicator was, specific, uh, you know, had to give some sort of a definable linear map. Again, th this was the, this, this is the closest we got to that, and this is what, uh, what makes it work. I say we, this is really Bjarke's uh, work. So the idea is this. We have a pebble game. Um, and now, at any point of the game, so we have k pebbles as before, k pairs of pebbles, k pebbles on A, k pebbles on B. At any point, spoiler can pick up 2m pebbles, so 2m is less than k. The idea is we're, we're going to look at m by, sorry, n to the m by n to the m matrices, so the in elements are going to be indexed by tuples of length 2m, m for the row, m for the column, okay? So spoiler specifies which pebbles he's going to move. Duplicator has to respond with the following. You look at, so we know it's going to be some matrix defined on A to the M, A to the M over here, and B to the M, and B to the M over here. So duplicator takes this and specifies some way of partitioning the space, right? I'll just draw it like this. I mean, obviously it doesn't have to be and some way of partitioning this into the same number of parts, and a bijection between these parts. Okay? For, for example. That's what duplicator has to specify. 
And the bijection has to have the following property. That if you, if you fill this matrix up with values 0 to p minus 1, with the proviso that each part, all the entries in each part take the same value, for any way of doing that here, fill this up the same way, you get a matrix of the same rank. This is what duplicator has to present. Some way of partitioning this and a bijection, which satisfies that condition. Okay? So duplicator gives a partition of A and partition of B and a bijection, such that for any labeling of the parts, you look at the matrices you get, they have the same rank. Once duplicator presents this, spoiler picks some tuple in this, some tuple in the corresponding part over there, those get pebbled, and the game proceeds. Okay? This is the game that captures these rank operators. As I said, it's a bit unwieldy, and we haven't really found a non, uh, an application that uses the full power of this to prove inexpressibility, right? For instance, it would be interesting to prove, say, directed reachability is not definable in this, but, yeah? Sorry? Yeah. Even in NP, that's right. And I'll, uh, yeah, we, we, we don't have any really concrete example of something that's, that, that we can use this to show. So, as I said, if we think of this, so effectively what we have defined now is a new notion of equivalence. K variable equivalence in the, in, in the, we can say first order logic with rank operators, which is now intermediate between this and isomorphism, right? There's a new family of equivalence relations. What do we know about them? Um, we know that each of these is in polynomial time. And in fact, this is, they, they provide an approximation of graph isomorphism. I've said this before. And in fact, it's a well-known one. It, it goes by the name of the, Wies, the Wiesfeler-Lehmann method, right? Or, so the, particularly, this would be the k-dimensional Wiesfeler-Lehmann method for, for CK. And as I said, you can uh, see uh, in, in, uh, from Groe's proof that for, on any minor closed class of graphs, uh, this Wiesfeler-Lehmann method, there is a fixed case so that the k-dimensional Wiesfeler-Lehmann method gives you isomorphism. And the CFI construction shows that there is no k for which this act you know, CK equivalence gives you graph isomorphism. We can ask the same sorts of questions with respect to RK. First of all, we don't even know that this equivalence relation is in polynomial time, right? This one is for every K. This one we don't know, okay? We, you look at the natural, I mean, you look at this definition, which gives you a sort of net, uh, algorithm, it involves a sort of uh, test at each stage over all partitions, which seems naturally exponential, oh, okay? And so we don't actually have a polynomial time algorithm for testing this as far as we know. Uh, could it be that there's a fixed value of k at which this becomes isomorphism? It's possible, we don't know, okay? Uh, okay. Another thing, this is just telling you about some very recent work we've been doing. We introduced this fixed point with rank logic because we found one problem, you know, rank of a matrix or definability of systems of equations, which was not definable in fixed point with counting. We then sort of step back and say, well, before we start talking about new logic and put in a new logic, let's look at the space of problems opened up by looking at solvability of systems of equations, look at the polynomial time problems there, and see which ones are reducible to which, okay? And reducible here means within, say, fixed point with counting. So that you know in some sense which is the maximally hard one you should be looking at. And it turns out we may have picked the wrong one in the sense that you can define systems of equations not just over finite fields, but say over finite rings or groups. As long as, and the thing is for finite rings, it's still polynomial time. For groups, as long as the group is abelian, it's again polynomial time, okay? So these are all problem solvable in polynomial time, but there's no corresponding notion of rank, and it's not clear that these 
problems can actually be expressed in fixed points with rank. Okay. Right. The, the, the notion of rank is something very specific about uh, you know vector spaces over finite fields is where it comes from because they have a, they have a notion of dimension, which say uh, is you don't get with modules over rings and so on. And what we did was we looked at all these various problems and found that they could within fixed point with counting you can reduce them all. We were hoping we could reduce them all to say solvability over a finite field, and that would mean that they were all definable in fixed point with rank. All we only got this far. We can reduce them all to solvability of equations over finite commutative local rings. Okay. So there's a problem, uh, which you know we would like to see whether we can express in fixed points with rank or not. Okay. Um, yeah. Now before I mean I'm 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 getting to the end of my talk, I wanted to say a little bit about another direction, which I haven't talked about. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I will, that, that will be. No, no, no. Reachability in directive graphs is in fixed point logic. It's, that, it's a candidate for not being in first order with rank. So, uh, a, so here's a, a candidate for not being in fixed-point rank is sol so solvability over, over finite rings, okay? which we say reduces to solvability over finite commutative local rings. We were hoping actually to reduce it down to finite fields and show it was definable, but we haven't done that. That's, uh, yeah, I'm not sure it's a candidate because I'm not sure I have a strong belief of whether it's definable or not. Okay? But in, in some sense, we're still developing a feel for, you know, I, I don't have a strong feel for using these games. I don't have, you know, a clear way of expressing this uh, this problem in in, uh, in the in the logic either. But uh, yeah, it's it, it's certainly a candidate for separating. I mean, there's there are other things. I mean. Um, I'll give you some things which we don't know at all the status of. Is for instance it's general matching, matching in graphs. And bipartite matching was shown to be in fixed point with counting by in a paper by Blasco, Revit, and Schiller. But general graph matching we don't know, either in fixed point with counting or fixed point with rank. Um, another thing which I don't think has been studied at all, of course, is uh, linear programming. I, I don't have a clear for formulation of that. Yeah, no, no, I don't have, I, I don't necessarily, I mean. Yeah, no, I, I don't know how you would express it, but I mean, you, first of all, you'd have to, I mean, it's a bit tricky because you have to sort of define linear programming in a way that makes sense as a, as a relational structure, you know, without bringing an order in it, which I think should be doable because, you know, this, it's an unordered set of constraints and so on. But it's, it's something I don't think anybody's looked at in, in, in definability terms. Okay, so choiceless polynomial time, I'm, just, I'm not going to say very much about it. I just, it's more because I want to mention another direction, because this is another proposal for extending fixed point with counting, uh, which was give, given by Blas and, Blas Gurevich and Shalab. It's, it's a logic in the, in the lo loose sense, in that it's, it's Defined on a machine model called the Gravitch abstract state machines, but it work machine model which works directly on relational structures, so it guarantees that it, that the things expressible are order invariant. Um, but to give the model sufficient power, it has access not just to the to the the relational structure, but to the universe of hereditarily finite sets over the relational structure. So it can construct sets of elements, sets of sets of sets of elements, and so on. And then we define the polynomial time restriction of this. It has to be polynomial time and space, which is suitably defined by saying that the, the transitive closure of these, these sets you use must all be polynomial in the size of the structure, and the number of steps is polynomial, et cetera. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to run through the, 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 the definitions. This is a proper extension of fixed point logic, but still can't do counting 
But then we can add counting to this choiceless polynomial time. So it's giving us a CPT card. And this uh, is yet another proposal for logic for p time. And it properly extends fixed point with counting. So here's what we know. It can express the property of uh, graphs of side theory MMM. Uh, but we know that any property, any program that expresses that CIF property must use, this, use sets of unbounded rank, which means in this universe of hereditarily finite sets, it's, you know, there's no finite nesting of sets and sets of sets and sets of sets that will do. Okay? No, so, so, so these all appear in this, in this paper uh, uh, with Dave Richerby and Ben Rossman. Okay. Um, so now, I, I mean, this is, I, I just wanted to mention this, and I want to sort of conclude in the last few minutes by telling you lots of open questions, okay? Because this is, uh, the, the, this, the, we're now at this sort of state of the art, and there are lots and lots of questions which we are still working on and thinking about, having to do with both, shall we say, the rank logic and choiceless polynomial time. I've mentioned many of these in the course of the talk. So we have this equivalence relation for each value of k, right? the equivalence relation of two structures being equivalent in the rank logic with k variables. For full definition, you know, I would suggest you can have a look at, I think the best source for information on that is Bjarke Holmes' PhD thesis. Is this equivalence relation itself definable in fixed point with rank, right? One of the key things over here was this equivalence relation turns out itself to be definable in IFP. This relation is definable in IFP with counting. Okay. It does something similar hold here? We, we, this would be a sign that this logic is nicely behaved if this equivalence relation was itself definable, which would in particular imply it's polynomial time decidable as well. We don't know that. Okay. Uh, or on, could it be that there is some fixed value of k for which this gives you isomorphism? Right? Is it actually an infinite sequence of re ever refining relations? Or could it be that there's a fixed value of k? I would be surprised, but I don't know the answer. Uh, can we solve linear equations over finite rings in fixed point with rank? This is what we were saying. I mean, it's more general than solving over, over fields, and we don't know whether uh, it reduces to that. Are there any problems in p time not definable in fixed point with rank? That's, of course, uh, interesting question. How about just separating fixed point with rank from first order with rank? This would be a nice exercise in, say, use of the games. Prove that you can't do alternating transitive closure in first order with rank, right? I mean, you, you were talking about directed reachability, which is complete for this. How about alternating reachability? Prove that it's not in first order with rank on unordered structures. Um, take any concrete problem, say an NP-complete one. This is, takes us back to Newton's question, right? Take any NP-complete problem, say three colorability, and prove that it's not in fixed point with rank. That would be nice. Uh, bounded degree graphs are an interesting case. So I, I gave you the, the, the examples where fixed point with counting captures uh, polynomial time, right, leading to Groy's result about minor closed graphs. Bounded degree graphs are another interesting case where we know, if you bound the degree, that there is a polynomial time isomorphism test. There's polynomial time canonical labeling. So in principle, there is a logic for P in, in, the, in the abstract sense, because canonical labeling is in polynomial time. But we know that fixed point with counting is not enough. Why? Because the cipher Emmerman construction can all be done with, 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 a, with a bound on the degree. Okay. So we know that fixed point with counting is not enough. Is fixed point with rank enough? This would really mean looking at the, those canonical labeling algorithms and trying to see if they can be expressed in fixed point with rank. They're enormously complicated. And this is partly what led us to looking at solvability of systems of equations over groups and wings rather than just fields because they're, they are group theoretic algorithms. So uh, that remains an open question. How about comparing fixed point with rank with choiceless polynomial time with counting, right? So these are two different extensions of fixed point with counting which have been proposed. 
And we know nothing about their relative expressive power. Is either one included in the other? We don't know whether choiceless polynomial time with counting can express the rank of a matrix, right? And we don't have any examples of something expressible in here, which is not expressible in there. We don't have an inclusion in either direction. Okay, all of this remains open. Uh, yeah, so this last one I've already mentioned is matrix ranks de definable in choiceless polynomial time with counting. We don't know. So lots of we don't knows to end this talk, and I'll stop here.